The Mediterranean world of the 18th to early 19th century was a violent and turbulent place. Most would cite the Napoleonic Wars and such battles as the Nile and Trafalgar as being the most decisive. Others may point to Russia's naval victories over the Ottoman Empire, strengthening the Russian crown and weakening Ottoman control over the region. But less known was an event that would occur in what was then called the Barbary States in present-day Tripoli. Spanning from Morocco to eastern Libya, the Barbary states were a loose confederation of feudal kings and warlords independent of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. Piracy had been one of the largest sources of income for these states, and for the last several hundred years thousands of people had been captured and forced into slavery by Barbary pirates. Most European nations were lenient on these practices, and would often pay exorbitant sums of money to secure the release of captives. In some cases, Piracy was even encouraged during times of war, enabling Barbary vessels to prey on the merchant ships of an enemy nation. In 1801, however, they would cross a line that would put these pirate kingdoms in the fight of their lives. years of paying tribute, the United States finally had enough and decided to use military action to quell the pirates. Numerous naval victories would not be sufficient, however, and so the U.S. decided that a land engagement would be necessary. Luckily, the U.S. would have an ace in the hole. Years earlier, the Bashaw of Tripoli, Hamet Karamanli, had been deposed and forced into exile in Egypt. His brother, Yusuf, who had deposed him, currently held the throne and was responsible for numerous raids against U.S. shipping. If the U.S. could assist him in retaking Tripoli, they'd have a powerful ally in the region and would certainly bring piracy to an end. American General William Eaton would assist Hammett in this endeavor and would devise a plan to hire an army of mercenaries to march to Tripoli and forcibly remove the illegitimate king from the throne. In March of 1805, Eaton and Hamet's mercenary army began its march towards the city of Tripoli. The army itself was made up of around 500 soldiers from various regions of Greece, North Africa, and the Middle East. It consisted of infantry, cavalry, and even artillery mercenaries. There were also several of the infamous Mameluke warriors. Raised as soldiers from infancy, the Mamelukes were considered some of the finest warriors in the world and held in high regard for their skill in combat. Eaton's army was a force to be reckoned with, but there was another part of his army that would soon become legend. For the last 30 years, the U.S. Marines have fought in both the American Revolution and the Kazai War with France, serving in mostly fleet security and sharpshooter type roles. Led by First Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, the Marines numbered eight total and were tasked with providing security for Eaton as well as accompanying him during the assault. For almost 50 days, Eaton's army marched along the African coast. But they would not go straight to the capital at first. Instead, they would first seize the breadbasket of Tripoli and deny Yusuf access to food, arms, and supplies. That city, which was the breadbasket of Tripoli, was Derna. Derna itself was a tough nut to crack. Heavily fortified, Derna was protected by a fortress in the north and a large wall to the south. Not to mention that it was defended by heavily armed Tripolitan defenders. To counter these defenses, Eaton's plan would require boldness and speed. The assault would begin with preparatory fires from Navy ships offshore to soften the defenses both at the fort and wall. Next, Eaton's supporting effort of cannons and infantry would assault the eastern side of the city, breach the walls, and secure the northern fort. Meanwhile, the main effort, which was Eaton's cavalry, would assault the western half of the city and secure the governor's palace. These two objectives, once met, 
would effectively cede control of the city to Eaton and Hammett. On the morning of April 27th, Eaton's army divided itself between the western and eastern halves, with Hammett and his cavalry on the left, and Eaton, the Marines, and his mercenary infantry on the right. The day prior, Eaton had sent a letter to the governor of Derna, asking for supplies and safe passage through the city. The governor's reply was, my head or yours. It was official. There would be a fight. The battle would begin with three American ships anchoring off the coast of Derna. The ships and Eaton's artillery then began to fire their salvos in order to weaken the city's defenses. After the walls and defenses were weakened, Eaton's army began to move into the city. But as they did, Loyalist forces rushed out to defend, and a vicious firefight ensued. As the fighting continued, Lieutenant O'Bannon charged his Marines forward and met the enemy with aggression and combat proficiency. As they got closer to the city's defenses, the intense musket fire forced the Marines to get behind cover and gain fire superiority before continuing to advance. On the western half of the city, Hammett and his cavalry encountered little resistance and were able to ride quickly to secure the governor's palace. The same can't be said for Eaton's advance. Under a barrage of musket fire, the marines and mercenaries were pinned down and could do little other than return fire. It's at this point that the marines suffered their first casualty. Fighting alongside them was General Eaton, dressed in Arabic garb. Eaton recognized the futility of the situation and decided that his only other option was as bold as it was suicidal. He would charge straight at the wall and force the defenders back. It was a hit or miss gamble, but he would get nowhere if his army remained where it was. Eaton sounded the charge. And he, the Marines, and his army charged the wall while taking heavy fire. During this charge, Eaton would be shot in the hand. And the Marines would suffer their next casualty. But surprisingly, the defenders were being routed. As the army moved forward, the Loyalists withdrew from their positions and yielded to the attackers. Once the defenders withdrew, the Marines had a clear path straight to the fort. Their next task was to raise the American flag over the shores of Tripoli and signal to the U.S. Navy that the fighting had ended. By nightfall of April 27th, Eaton's army had control over the city and vowed to remain there until they rebuilt their strength to continue on to the capital itself. In the meantime, skirmishing would continue over the next few weeks as Tripolitan forces would attempt several counterattacks, but all were unsuccessful. As Eaton was preparing to march to the capital in early June, he would be informed of a treaty signed by Yusuf and the United States. Tripoli would end all acts of piracy against American shipping for a small fee, and no further tribute would be required control over Derna would be relinquished back to the Barbary states, 
and Eaton, the Marines, and the U.S. Navy all were to return to the U.S.